Praise Yah, the Most High Yahweh Yeshua, and the Ruach. This is in honor of you. I pray that this message blesses the hearers. I pray a hedge of protection around the hearers and this message. Hi guys, Selena here. Welcome to Into All Truth. Jacob's 12 sons conquered Israel by defending Dinah. Is honoring sisters a key to the promised land? And the reason why I'm asking you this question is because I do, of course, get from some of the guys online this, don't, why are you teaching your woman? Well, Titus sisters are supposed to teach younger women. And I invite men as well to listen to the teaching. Of course, we're going to start with the creation of Adam and Eve in the beginning so that we can understand that we are made in the image of God and that the Godhead has been revealed and is revealed in all things since the beginning of time and even before time. And so one of these scriptures that I really love that speaks to this is from Joshua 24, 24. For there have been many years like those that are desolate from the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of those who are like them who sleep in the earth, and upon whose account you did say that you created the world. So the chosen people were called out of time and eternity, even before the creation of the earth. And the earth was created for us. It was not created for the angels to then come down and create their own people. It was created for us. So that's where we have to start. Everything is basically revealed in heaven and then on earth. So it is supposed to be on earth as it is in heaven. Do not confuse this with the Luciferian as above, so below. Totally different. This is on earth as it is in heaven. So the word says that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from his works, workmanship so that men are without excuse. That tells us that out of time and eternity, Yahweh has first created things. So Adam or Adam and Eve were created even before the establishment of the earth. And there's a lot of scriptures to back that up. Yeshua has blessed us in Yeshua with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So that's what Ephesians 1, uh, 1 to 23 says. So this is talking again about how these things are predetermined in time. Basically, the point I'm trying to make is that man and woman are made in the image of the eternal Godhead of Yahweh. And so that's how we are made in his image. And so when we get to the first scripture in Genesis that talks about the creation of man and woman, people get a little confused. They're like, okay, here he says he created man and woman, and then later on it says he formed him out of the dust of the earth and removed Eve from his side. Well, um, the reason for that is because some people who believe in, you know, that Satan was on the earth first and created his race first, uh, it, it's just not true. What this is, is the first creation of Adam and Eve is Yahweh creating us or our great-grandparents first in the heavenly spiritual realm and then on earth. So and that's why I brought up these scriptures to support this. Psalm 139.16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So that's why we have God saying, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the, the earth. And uh, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he made them. So the nature and character of God is male and female. And so we are made after his likeness. And it even says, he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So that's even in the, the image of his dominion, having dominion and authority over the earth. So that's in every aspect in terms of the Godhead as well. So male and female, he created us. So he created us, um, male and female, to be one. Okay, so that's Yah the Father who is the Holy Spirit, the Son, that's the Godhead.
God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she has been taken out of man. And therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, Ye shall eat not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now that last part was wrong. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, and make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and decided to eat, and gave also to her husband, who was with her the whole time, and did eat. One of the main things that you'll notice here is that after God creates, after Yahweh creates Adam, he gives them him the instruction about the garden, to keep the garden. And he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So what's happening here when finally Lucifer, the serpent, tempts Eve in the garden? The two of them are not one in that moment, okay? She only answers the enemy, yet Adam is right there with him, okay? And so Adam is blamed for the sin of the world because he is the head, he is the first, he is the leader, and he has the authority of Yahweh over him. So this is really important for men to understand how to embrace their power and understand the authority that men have over women. She stood up and she quoted but she didn't have the whole truth because the other half of her was standing right there with part of the truth also. Do you know what I mean? So she didn't quote correctly and he didn't correct her or stand up for her and or protect her or take his authority over her because even in scripture it says if a woman makes a promise to somebody, her husband is able to retract it because he has that authority over her. She has to consult with him before agreeing to do something because they're one person, one body. So you see that law within marriage. And so he had that opportunity in that situation with the enemy and he didn't do it because he has that authority, okay? So uh, it's not to purely blame men for this, but it's for men to understand your authority, okay? So, and it's for women to understand that as well. It's not to say, oh, let's just blame them, blame men for this, you know. It's, it's you know, she should have been like, honey, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, she should have been checking with him, but she didn't. She, but they were children, whatever, and it was preordained from time. So the other thing here is that men are given the word of Yah and then communicate it to women. So he was given the command and he did not fully communicate it. To Eve. So I want to address some other controversies around the identity of women in relation to men. And a lot of these camps and people following twisted doctrines believe females are created solely for men. Now, the female was created for Adam. Eve was created for Adam as a helpmeet. That is true. But are we created solely for men? Genesis says, Then Yah said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, 
Yah created man in his own image, and in the image of Yah, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we are both made in his image. And some translations say that we were taken from his side, half of him. So are we to be a help meet alone to men? Well, there's nothing wrong with being a help meet. The Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. All of this is a type and a shadow of the final union with Yah, a marriage. Most women, we all dream of marriage, so it's a blessing. Meet implies two people meeting together equally. For fruit, productivity, creation, we are a gift to men, and marriage is a blessing associated, associated with Yah. So whoever gives is blessed. It is much more blessed to give than to receive. So women serve men in marriage. But what about those of us who are single? Should we be multiplied wives among men? Well, adultery and fornication, that's multiple wives and concubines are a sin and anyone who does those things shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, the unmarried man cares for the things of Yah that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So it's almost more ideal for us to be single and to be dedicated to pleasing Yah. So again, I'm going to return to Genesis where it says, Yah said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And Yah created man in his own image and in the image of Yah, he created them male and female. He created them. Also, when we look at scripture, Yah does have the appearance of a man. Of course, he is Yah. He is the most high. He's not a man. So Ezekiel says, and as they stood still with their wings lowered, a voice came from above the expanse that was over their heads. Above the expanse over their heads was the likeness of a throne with the appearance of sapphire. And on the throne high above was a figure like that of a man. Like that of a man. Not a man because he's the most high. But you see, we're made in the image of Yah, physically, the Most High. Now, I'm saying all of this to get to the point that Adam was called the son of Yah. Adam sinned, and then everyone after him was called the son of man. And technically, we replace the angels as human beings once we are transformed in Yeshua. So this portion is about the fact that because we are angels, we are not created solely for men. We are created for Yah as women. So how can we be solely created for men? We serve our husbands like angels serve Yah, but our partners are not the most high. We serve Yah above even them, and especially those of us who are unmarried because we don't have to be concerned with pleasing our husbands, but with pleasing Yahweh. So we are created to serve the Most High Yah. And so here's some scriptures that really point to the sons of Yah being the angels. And at, we've already shown you that Adam was called the son of Yah. And after that, human beings were called the son of man. And that's why Yeshua came as the son of man. So um, here's Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. Yeshua says, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So this means we are not created solely for men. We are created for Yah. So I just really want to warn against error, this multiplying wives and concubines, or that women are created solely for men. That is, is niggardly slavery. So one of the first instances where you hear the Son of Man mentioned is in Numbers 23, 19. Yah is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. 
Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he not spoken, and shall he not make it good? For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day, is what Matthew 12, 8 says. So Yeshua is the Son of Man and a Son of God. So further evidence to us being replacing the angels, being like the angels, Hasetan is described as being a son of God and all of the angels as sons of God. And the prince of Tyre is another name for Hasetan. So here, son of man is mentioned again in Ezekiel applying to us as descendants of Adam. Ezekiel, son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus says the Most High, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of the Most High in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. You see, Satan here has become a man and is no longer a son of Yah. He is no longer a son of God. Then 28, 9, it says, Will thou set thyself, will thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God, but thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. So again, Satan, Hashetan has become a man. Again, Ezekiel 28, 12 says, Son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, is, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Most High, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Yah. Every precious stone was thy covering. So it goes into all of the coverings that were upon him. But we see in this Ezekiel 28, 13, that these are the descriptives of Hasetan in Eden as the fallen angel. And now he becomes a man in his fallen state. And so, and so here are all the, the scriptures that talk about the angels being referred to as the sons of Yah or sons of God, as you might have heard it before. So this, that the sons of Yah saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And here's another one. There, Genesis, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of Yah came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them and they became the mighty men, which were of old men of renown. I'm not going to read all of these now. There was a day when the sons of Yah came to present themselves before the Most High, and Hasetan came also among them. Okay, and here's another one, the same thing. Sons of Yah came to present themselves before the Most High, and Hasetan came also among them to present himself before the Most High. And here's another one. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of Yah shouted for joy. And these are our promises. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of Yah, Yah, even to them that believe on his name. For as many as are led by the Spirit of Yah, they are sons of Yah. For with earnest expectation, every creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of Yah, that, they, that, we, that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of Yah without rebuke in the midst of the crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights to the world. First John, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the sons of Yah. First John, we the sons of Yah, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So a third of the nation, a third of the nations will be destroyed and one third of the angels felled. So a third of the nations will be destroyed and one third of the angels fell. So we will replace the angels. So we are created to serve Yah. First in the heavens, we were created. Then we had our purpose on earth and we return in heavenly form as the sons of Yah to the heavenly realm or to the kingdom when it comes on earth. 
So honoring us as sisters in Yeshua, queens and priests in Yeshua HaMashiach is key to re-entering the Promised Land. So there are a number of examples of women in the Bible who just got me so excited as a woman because I had a little bit of a fear that Yahweh did not love women when, because of everything the world had said about the Bible, which of course was not true, right? And even that false Constantine Christianity can say about the word. So, um, you know, I want this to be a, a really encouraging message for men as well as women. I don't want you to be fearful about this. I know I have my military message about how Yah regards, you know, rape and violence against women. But this is a kind of a gentler message. And But I, I'm really here to empower women to understand the love that Yahweh has for us. So in reading the Bible, often through the Constantine Christianity, I would hear this kind of word about the women who are always mentioned in the Bible. So I found in biblical Christianity, women tended to be celebrated as concubines, captive ladies in waiting, prostitutes, Gentiles, strangers, or second wives. And I also found that a little bit, this is kind of how they are celebrated or positioned in the camps a little bit too. And Abigail was one of them who had the foolish husband and uh, she protected her husband against or I guess his whole land against the army of David because David had been guarding his sheep and protecting his land and he just asked for provisions and her husband was like no all of these people are abandoning their kings and he's being irresponsible well he had just protected his land from all these bandits and so he, David was about to go and kill this man and his wife came out with all the provisions he needed. And when she got back to her husband, he dropped dead because she had to explain to him that he just, she just fended off the whole army of David who was about to come kill him. And he just dropped dead. She became David's wife. Well, for me, you know, yeah, she was a wise woman. This is often held up in the church as like a wise woman. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, she was wise, but I couldn't identify with her. I mean, I was like, he was a stupid man. I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, literally, his name means foolish. And she tells David that. She knows what his name is. She knew what his name was. She knew what it meant. I wouldn't have married a stupid man like that. <laughs> I mean, how wise was she after all? And then she goes into a polygamous relationship with David who already has a wife. I mean, come on. I don't, I don't know how wise she was. She was wise about preventing the death of her whole farm and family. Now, obviously, I've made foolish mistakes with men, but that is certainly not the biblical ideal. So I couldn't identify with her. And then there was Rahab the prostitute. Well, I'm not a prostitute. Say if women are with more than one man, then I guess maybe they're prostitutes. I don't know. But, um, you know, I didn't identify with Rahab the prostitute. who helped the Israelites and eventually became a great-grandmother of David. I remember standing on the street one day waiting for a bus and some guy drove up to see if I was a prostitute. I was 14. If I would get in his car, because I'm a prostitute because I'm a black woman. And I looked 14. And even if I looked 16, what the hell? So I really had to guard my dignity. And so that's something that all women need to do because that's how Yahweh sees us. He wants us to guard our dignity. We are precious to him and the scripture he always gave me over and over again when I would do that whole random grab a scripture thing, you know, when I didn't know what was going on or where to go or what to do, it would be always, the king is enthralled with your beauty. As the king's daughters are among thy honorable woman, and upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Orphur. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. For he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. So those are the kinds of things that you can hold on, and you have every right to that dignity because you do come from queens and kings and priests and holy people. A holy people. You are holy. You are set apart. And so 
anytime someone is asking you to do something or be something that is not that then you've got to hold your grace and I remember my mother was like that I would see West Indian women like that I would see African American women who were like that who would just hold their poise and their grace and it's natural it's very natural to many um, women of African ancestry and I know we go through these times of degradation or mistreatment all women do um, but you've really got to battle it with that inner dignity and poise that you try to maintain in any given situation because it's what Yahweh has for you. The king is enthralled with your beauty. You know, just worship him, give him the glory in your spirit, and honor him when you're in these situations and that will help you hold your grace. And that's the beauty of your spirit. And so that should help you to carry yourself. And it's something that's taken a long time. You know, until you can hold it with grace and kindness. Try to be kind and loving to people, but you have every right to carry yourself with grace and dignity. And, and I couldn't identify with Esther the concubine. <laughs> Esther the concubine, I mean, she has a noble role. She has to undergo this kind of uh, bachelor contest where she's anointed in oils and she has to go and sleep with this Medo-Persian king to see if he likes her personally, emotionally, physically, and sexually. And then eventually he does like her, he chooses her as queen, and you know, praise Yah, she saves her people from genocide. But I mean, she has a noble role, and I understand, you know, that was the way that it was for women back in the day, you know, women were concubine and chattels, and, and at the time, they were basically in a ca kind of captivity, so that was the best she could do in the situation that she was in, and in her lowly place, Yah lifted her up for such a time as this, and I understand the grandeur of that, but I'm like, Bachelor, I watched The Bachelor, and I'm so disgusted with that show, so I'm like, I'm not going to go and be part of one of those women on The Bachelor and see if the guy will like me and court a man. I think a man should court a woman. Why am I getting dressed up in lotions and oils and then sleeping with some king to see if he's going to have me? To me, I'm like, that's prostitution. That's a concubine. She's not even sure that she's going to get married. I think that, you know, Yah prefers that we're honored more as women, <laughs> and I know he does. So I'm like, I can't identify with her. And then, and then there was, these are all the women lifted up in the church. And then there was uh, oh, Ruth. She slept at, at Boaz's feet. And again, it was like covered, covered herself with his blanket. I just, it just seemed really... I couldn't identify with all that. It was like, I know there was a lot of symbolism going on in there and Shinsman Redeemer and she had to appeal to him. And he says, you know, you could have chosen an attractive man, but instead, like a younger man, but instead you chose me and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, um, yeah, well, you know, she's got good character and she chose to do the right thing over, um, and the, the proper legal thing according to the word of Yah. So that was something to respect. And what I found really interesting was that her true kinsman redeemer could not redeem her. And his reasoning was that he said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself for I cannot redeem it. And it seemed to imply to me that he was already married and he did not want to fornicate or become an adulterer. And then recently I heard a study uh, that we did on Sukkot with uh, Nia, the daughter, the mother of Huldah of uh, the Ark of... Ministry. So it gave me confirmation in my position on why Ruth wasn't redeemed by her actual kins kinsman redeemer, but instead by Boaz. And so it really reinforces the idea that adultery was not part of the ideal design. And you always have to look and know, as it was before, so it shall be again. The original design is always the model. So the other key was that Ruth had a wonderful relationship with her mother-in-law, and she truly loved her, and she loved the Israelite sisters as well. 
and this is why she got this high position of honor. But um, I couldn't really see myself identifying with her either. Uh, Zephora, I did identify with her because she was an Ethiopian and because she was the wife of Moses and she was very wise to circumcise their son so that Moses wasn't murdered because she had that spiritual wisdom. So I could identify with Zephora, okay? So, but apparently she courted Moses for, day, for years. She visited him in prison, looked after him because she knew he was a king. She knew who he was. So, uh, I don't really approve of chasing after men, but apparently one can. So, it's okay on Sephora, but I didn't know that until now, until I've been studying the broader book. So, Sephora identified, identified with her a little bit. So I had to really look for women in the Bible that I could identify with. You know, these scriptures are very much directed at the Gentiles identifying as outsiders outside of the kingdom of Israel. And it's no wonder I didn't identify with them because that was not me ultimately. But, you know, I can see how Yah blessed us in this sense because as a Christian for me, that's how I identified, was as an outsider, as somebody of African ancestry. So, uh, although I didn't identify with these women, except I did with Sephora, I didn't identify with Ruth and, um, and so on, but I can see how Yah brought us in as an outsider and made us feel outside so that when we finally learned we were inside, wow, what a blessing. So I was like, who am I going to identify with? Well, and so this leads me to how Hebrew Israelite women distinguish ourselves from, you know, the Gentile or Christian women out there, because who I was identifying with really has sort of answered that question for me. When I started reading the word and I read about, um, it seemed to be, and now I'm not saying I'm a prophet, i got to be careful with this, but it seemed to be the judges and the prophetesses that I identified with. A prophetess is one who communicates God's heart, perspective, and counsel on the situation, and to use Paul's definition, comforts, encourages, and strengthens the community. So I will give you part two of this message in a couple of days, which I've already done, and... That is because everyone's like, I've got to give my messages in small bites. So this is me trying to give you guys messages in small bites on part two, which will focus around prophetesses. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And please let me know if you want me to break my messages up to into 20-minute messages, just to make it more digestible. Thanks for watching. God bless.